So I am Karen Simonton, and I am here today to talk to you and to provide for you really resources around one of the largest issues that we have in all of our practices, and that is providing benefits to our team. And I had the opportunity most recently with Carl Schusler to spend some time, Carl and Taylor, and actually Bill Miller and Doug Aldean, and spend some time in Texas with the Health Rosetta folks who really are working diligently to create more innovative ways to deliver benefits to their team members. And I'm struck with three things. The first thing is that in order to really do this, you have to be a courageous employer. And I spent probably three weeks in my head just sort of trying to figure out what is a courageous employer, what is a courageous employer, what is a courageous employer. And I know what a courageous employer is because I've worked for one for 22 years. And every orthopedic group, every musculoskeletal group within the ortho forum, they're courageous employers. They're people who say, this is broken and we know we can fix it. We just need the tools and the, um, and the partners in that space to actually do things that are more innovative. And we also understand that while some people would say that healthcare is broken, I would suggest to you that it's actually not broken, it's actually built specifically to support a lot of middlemen who are taking a lot of money, which is actually our employees' compensation. Benefits are just compensation in a different form, who are taking our employees' compensation uh, and profiting off of it. So courageous employer, you all are courageous employers. Uh, there are ways to fix what is not working properly for our team members in a system that's not broken. It was designed actually for this purpose. Um, and lastly, the whole concept of crawl, walk, run, and, and to speak uh, as a person who actually spent Martin Luther King's birthday watching Selma with my family, which was a, I would suggest that to all of you, that was a really good experience. You know, one of the things that Martin Luther King said is, you know, crawl, walk, run, but by all means, move forward. And that is what we need to do. So without any further ado, um, I, this is our, our benefits workshop panel today. Carl Schusler, who's with Mitigate Partners and has had a 30 year history in the benefit uh, space and has now for the last seven years been running a company that has actually delivered on this promise and that is building a system that will deliver benefits in a cost-effective and value-based way to employers who are just tired of getting a 30% increase and having to redesign benefits and push more onto their team members. And so he does that in, a, in a, the Health Rosetta framework, but he runs a company called Mitigate Partners, and he has partners in that space, some of whom are here today, and he will introduce those. Gene Austin, who's the CEO of Columbia Orthopedic Clinic, uh, a longtime partner of mine on the board of the Ortho Forum, and a person who's living in this space and has done a lot of things to build programming for his employees that is, is, is continued to evolve as he's learned more about healthcare delivery and ways to uh, create a better benefit, a benefit value for his employees. And then Tommy Diener, who is my partner at Ortho Virginia uh, for some time, who is the Chief Human Res Resources Officer for over 1,500 employees that cross the Commonwealth of Virginia. And she will also share some uh, jewels of wisdom, particularly along the path of merger and acquisition and what you do to get benefit design moving in one direction and some of the innovative things that they've done in that space. So the first question I would ask is how many of you in this audience are uh, self-insured? Okay, now we got an answer. A, a fair number. So we, we will learn a, lo a lot more about how to take that self-insurance uh, proposition and really to supersize it and get all the juice that it's worth uh, worth out of it. So again, I'm Karen Simonton. And you know, the bottom line is price. Marilyn Bartlett, who actually was the comptroller for the, for the state of Montana and is number 13 on the Fortune magazine's top business people, you know, one of the things she said is we keep throwing things at employees, wellness and utilization, which is part of the part of the equation, but really it's about price. You know, when hospitals continue to change their charge master and continue to elevate pricing and health insurance contracts are percentages off of price, we, we know this really is a pricing issue. 
So there are only two benchmarks that really matter and ultimately move the needle, and they are medical expense per employee per year and prescription drug expense per member per month. It, for those of you in the audience, do you know those numbers offhand? Are those metrics that are known to you? And so we can see here that the um, per employee per year medical expense number runs at about 12,000. Um, obviously, if you know your organization's number, you can get a good idea about that. And then if we look at what other people are doing in the space, most uh, notably Mitigate Partners, they are running 2,100 to 7,000 less than the per member per month medical expense ratio. And Carl will talk a lot more about that when he takes the stage. And then our per member per month prescription drug expense on average around 100, obviously your organization's benchmark, and then mitigate partners running at 44% under the national average in the fair cost plan. So without any further ado, I will turn the stage over to Carl. I don't think so. No, I'm going to, I'm going to, so are we good here? Is everybody, do we? need to cover what's the difference between fully insured and self-funded? Is everybody pretty comfortable with that? Is that a yes? Okay, good. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn this back over to Gene in just a second. Let me get through these. We'll cover this real fast. All right, so this, this is, those are your three choices for purchasing insurance. And everybody knows what I think fully insured is, and everybody knows what self-funded is. And what Gene's going to talk about is what he's done some great things for his firm in a, in a captive environment. So I'm going to turn it over to him, and we're going to skip forward of all of these. Save you all the pain. I flew in from New York City, if you all can tell. I'm, I'm from New York. <laughs> and I appreciate you laughing, because otherwise I'd look like a fool. So thank you. <laughs> all right, go ahead, Gene. Well, I'm Gene Austin from the Columbia Orthopedic Group. <clears throat> Those of you who are, are fully insured, could you raise your hand? Okay, because the eight of you are the folks that I really came to talk to today. <clears throat> we, are, um, we are 27 physicians located right in the middle of Missouri. We had watched for years our health span continue to climb. When I first joined the practice a number of years ago, we were insured by Blue Cross Blue Shield. And that's good. That's a good response. <clears throat> and for several years in a row, <clears throat> we'd have our, you know, our representative come in and say, "Healthcare is tough. <clears throat> we're going to change the way the rules are. Uh, we're going to adjudicate these claims." We'd go back and do the math. Oh, we're getting about a five percent decrease in reimbursement from Blue Cross. Oh, okay. <clears throat> about two weeks later, our uh, our health insurance broker would come in and say, "Oh, I got some bad news. You got a twenty percent increase on your." Blue Cross premiums. And so that quit being fun after just a couple of years, and we started doing some research into the whole idea about self funding our health plan. Perhaps your experience, those of you who've already made this jump, found yourself in the same situation. I brought this up with our broker, uh, <clears throat> and he said, You know what? You really got to have about a gazillion employees before this makes sense. So, well, let's come back and talk about it later. A year would go by, and I'd come back, Charlie, this, we can't keep on this path. We've got to take, well, you know, it's coming down now. I think now you only have to have about 250 employees. And so finally, we, we did this math, and so <clears throat> with a little more research, I'm not going to blame it all on him. It was, a big, it was a big scary step, and I wasn't sure. Somehow there is comfort. I love the term Carl has, the buka, and he'll explain that here in a little bit, I'm sure. Somehow you, it's easy to go to bed at night knowing I can send a claim off to Blue Cross Blue Shield Aetna, or UHC and it's going to get paid. <clears throat> it took me several years before I realized, <clears throat> excuse me, all that meant is that in a bad year I'm borrowing money from a large insurance company who discloses no payment terms, no rate of interest, or if and when I'm ever going to you know, have that note paid off. And in that moment of crystallization, I realized we've got to make a jump. And ironically, that same year when I had my conversation with my broker, he said, you know what? I think you're right. This is the year. <clears throat> 
the num <clears throat> pardon me, the numbers aren't all that important. You'll see, you know, for several years, our spend per employee, you know, we're fairly, you know, we're fairly close to average. You see, we're kind of trending up a little bit. You get to 2017 and you see this dip. For those of you who have made the jump to self self-funding, <clears throat> perhaps your experience has been like ours. All the research I'd done indicated that out of five years, you're going to have you know, one really bang up great year, you're going to have a couple break even years, you're going to have one, eh, not so bad, and you're going to have one that just kill you. And when you jump into self-funding, <clears throat> you just hope that you're lucky enough that that really bad year is not year one. And so that was our experience. So we made the jump at the end of 2016, and our first year, <clears throat> we won on two, on two fronts. We'd had a little bit of health, uh, we'd had a little bit of claims experience in 2015. United Healthcare had come to us, and after our broker did, you know, whatever magic, uh, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod they do with, with health, uh, you know, with United Healthcare, they came back and said the best we can do is about an 18% increase. We really raked them over the coals, Gene, but the 18%, that's the best deal we got. We had been accepting those terms for a number of years. <clears throat> So instead of taking 18% on, on top of our million dollars in premium, we said, no, we're going to go self-funding. And then that next year, our claims experience dropped way down. <clears throat> so the first year, not only did we save back a quarter of a million dollars, we easily avoided a, you know $250,000 in premium increase. <clears throat> our second year, we avoided what uh, I you know, figured would have been another 12% increase. This last year, uh, you know, we, if we had stayed fully insured, we'd get hammered for our experience this last year. I don't have a slide that shows this, but our experience year one, we were way ahead financially. Year two was the break-even year, getting ready for the year three, which was this last year, we had some big claims. We rang our stop-loss uh, bell a couple of times, we had one of our partners have a, a significant health episode <clears throat> and uh, that he was all too glad to tell his partners about how well our insurance had paid. So the idea of self-funding is a concept that you have to look at differently. And those of you who've made the jump, you understand that. Those of you who haven't made the jump yet, you will look at your insurance. It is important that you look at your program differently. He sat in a meeting here not too long ago, and he said, oh, yeah, I was on this experimental drug, build, a, you know, build our plan $30,000 a month. And, you know, our plan paid $20,000 of that. That's pretty good, isn't it? <coughs> the, the partners sitting around the table who have made the jump in, uh, in their thinking were, were not as thrilled as, uh, as what he was. <coughs> Bottom line, it is all about... You know what, what Carl would talk about, what Tommy talked about, what Karen set up. It is about taking control. For those of you who like to keep uh, aspects of your organization under your control, bringing the self-funding about, <clears throat> we didn't. Uh, you know, we wanted to ameliorate risk as much as possible, so we joined. Uh, you know, we participate in a health captive. That if you have questions, we can talk about that offline. I don't know if we want to take that time right now, but it's just another avenue where we spread, you know, we spread our risk. We set our stop loss, the first $50,000 in a claim, we're going to pay out of our, you know, we're going to pay out of our pocket. Anything over that, we're going to turn over to uh, basically the captive in which we are part owner. So as a result, we have, uh, our employees and our physicians have gone now four years with no increase in the cost of their health benefits. During that time, we have made some, you know, we've made some slight modifications, so people are pretty happy with the plan. We big, uh, we're big believers in personal responsibility. Probably one of the most significant things we did was implement a, a health savings account and fund that fairly generously. So all of a sudden, employees are recognizing, wait a minute, I'm spending my money, and I'm not going to go do that. When you think you're spending United Healthcare's money, your employees will have a whole different attitude towards towards that. So as a result, I'm standing here, hopeful that uh, this year we're starting off to swing back into a good year. Our major claims that we dealt with last year, we think, are resolved. We're not looking for that to go forward. <clears throat> Our cash flow, we're beginning to build back up, and uh, you know, hopefully by this time next year, I can say, yep, we rode the seesaw up and down, and now we're back in a good position. But for us. 
we're close to a million dollars ahead of where we would have been if we'd stayed with United Healthcare, just because we have avoided uh, you know double-digit premium increases over the last several years. You're all teed up. Can you see me? <laughs> I'll stand over this way. Um, good afternoon. I'm Tommy Diener. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer for Ortho Virginia. I'm going to uh, share with you a little bit today about our journey related to benefits and um, sort of how we approached it. I think one of the things that Karen said that was really um, meaningful as we talk about Ortho Virginia's um, strategy is that you have to move forward. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done and some of the things that we have on the horizon and coming forward. Um, so where we started, Ortho Virginia, I joined Ortho Virginia in 2017, and in 2017 we had merged in uh, four different practices to become Ortho Virginia. All of them had different plans, different carriers, different plan designs. One was self-insured, the rest were fully insured. Um, we had, um, basically it was a fun mess um, for us to try and figure out how we were going to integrate everything together. Um, and so where we started was really kind of taking a step back and looking at all of our various plans and trying to figure out what we needed to do to get forward. One of our core values as an organization is that we do want to be a workplace where our employees feel valued and respected. Um, and part of that is ensuring that we provide them with compensation and benefits that are competitive um, that reflect that value. And so that was something that we really went into our plan designs from a self-insurance perspective. Uh, to make sure that we accomplished. Um, so really, what I really want to stress with you guys is um, don't sit and hope. Um, I, I've always heard, you know, hope's not a strategy. Um, when I started, one of the very first board meetings that I went into, we talked about a multi-year plan to get to where we needed to be. We knew that looking at all these disparate plan designs, carriers, and funding approaches, we weren't going to get there in one year. And so we really laid out a comprehensive strategy on how we were going to move forward as an organization to get to our end goal of being um, self-insured um, collectively. Um, obviously with um, 1,500 employees, we have over 1,000 lives on our, um, our employees on our plan, um, you know, that, that we have a lot more bargaining power as one um, versus as these little groups. And so in 2017, um, you know, we had different, um, we were on a, um, uh, minimum premium plan, have you ever heard of those? They're like the plans that are like faux self-insured where you practice that being self-insured. Well, we had a really bad year because um, when we went to jump forward, it was actually, that was the year where we had several catastrophic claims um, come through and we were facing a 23% premium increase um, with the carrier. Um, we had hit our stop loss coverage under the minimum premium plan several times and that was just a real um, challenge um, for us. Um, so in 2018, we finally got to the same plan designs. We finally got to um, self-insured, but we were still two separate buckets. So we had this one little plan that was self-insured over here, and then all the other people over here, because guess what? We were also in different enrollment windows, July and January of every year. It was a nightmare. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, but we also rebid our stop-loss coverage. Um, so when you guys are looking at your self-insured plans and where you want to start pulling the triggers from a negotiation perspective, really be pushing on your stop loss coverage. You should be bidding that every couple of years. Um, don't sit on it. We had one, the little small self-insured plan that we had, they hadn't bid their stop loss pro uh, product in probably seven years. Um, we came back and I think we saw like a $300,000 reduction um, on their premiums. It was very significant for those individuals. So, you know, don't sit and let it just be there, um, you know, have a strategy, make sure you're looking at these things. Um, we also were able to negotiate um, RX rebates in our plans, so that's something that you can't do within your fully insured plans, so make sure you're pushing on that. Uh, we started at 25%, um, we went to 50%, um, and then in 2020 we're going to see 100%. Um, the great thing though is now we're on one plan, so I just got my 2019 numbers. Uh, we went from about 50,000 back from an RX rebate, um, I just got 
got our 2019 numbers is about 250,000. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of money. Um, and then next year, we're looking at about a half million on our um, RX rebate because we're all on one plan. We're large enough to get it on all of them. Uh, and we're getting 100% back. Push for 100%. Okay. Um, the other thing that we did too is that we had to laser one of our claims. So really as you're looking at your self-insured um, plan, you may have some high dollar claimants that you know are going to be sitting out there for a long time. I have somebody who has a very rare blood condition, can only go to three facilities in the United States. Um, and she is going to exceed her stop loss coverage every year. Uh, and that is a spouse of a physician who we know is going to be on our plan for several years to come. Um, and so we lasered that claim. We ran the numbers and the pro forma to see by lasering the claim and the additional expense we would be paying against the stop loss premium increases, what that would be. Um, and we ended up finding out that it would help us. And so we did um, those types of things as we were trying to contain our costs from an Ortho Virginia perspective. Um, for 2020, uh, we're really struggling right now f uh, for a very simple reason of trying to get our contribution strategies aligned. So we had um, several regions who um, the employer contribution was a lot more than some of our other regions, um, and they made the employees pay a lot more. Uh, we finally got uh, alignment with three out of our four regions um, to raise the employer contribution. So in the midst of all of our plan design changes, not only are we trying to keep premium costs down, but we're also trying to increase as an employer what we're giving to employees, which is really unheard of, right? So in our 2020 plan year, we had employees who just got phenomenal um, pay increases because we started contributing more. Um, as an employer. But part of that communication strategy for those employees was to know that it is not the carrier paying your claim. It is the physicians that you work with every day and your shareholders that you look at every day that are paying your claims. And so when they ask me, Tommy, like, why are benefit costs co going so high? The response is, is well, you. Um, <laughs> you can do a lot to control your costs. So we do a lot of messaging around taking care of yourself. Um, and 2020 is really our year of wellness. Um, so we have comprehensive employee communication strategies around wellness, what you can do. Uh, we do predictive analytics on our claims. Um, so we actually have a third party vendor that we feed our claims in where we can do predictive analytics. We know that, um, you know, hypertension, high blood pressure, pressure, uh, you know, we need to lose weight. Um, so we're doing, we're implementing a program where we can identify our pre-diabetic plan participants and allow them to participate in a lifestyle management plan. Uh, it's an app. Um, we feed it through our claims based on percent of weight loss. Um, so there's a lot of things that we're trying to do to target the populations that we know are driving our health care costs. And like every other plan, sponsor or, or employer in the United States, orthopedic claims are really big for us. Uh, have you guys noticed that about your plans too, right? Uh, <laughs> surprise, which is great, right, for, you, for our orthopedic surgeons, right? On the, on the payer side, they love that. On the employee side, they don't. So one of the things that we're working on doing for 2021 is to embed um, domestic steerage into our plans. Um, so we're actually going to create an Ortho Virginia network where our and we're going to try and partner with other um, practices out there who have low-cost imaging. Um, MRI um, and other services and we're going to try to drive our employees um, to domestic steerage um, so that we that way we know we're the low cost provider we know it and we know that there are other independent medical practices out there that are the low cost providers and so we want to drive our employees to these high quality low cost providers to help drive our claims costs down as well um, so that's something that we're going to be implementing in 2021 um, and then we're going to be looking at spousal wellness credit and um, continued employee education. Um, for the plan year ended 2019, we have about 70% of our employees participating in our plan. Um, our PEPM is about $7,000 um, per employee per year. Um, and again, as Carl was saying, the, the national benchmark is about 12 to 15,000. So, you know, it's it, 
it hurts my physicians when they're looking at year over year claims uh, cost increase, but we still are pushing on this because we know um, while we're, we're while we're doing well compared to national benchmarks, we know that we can't sustain continued medical expense cost increases, and so we have to keep pushing on it from a strategy perspective. Um, and then our RX claim costs are ninety eight dollars uh, per member per month, and actually that number is a little bit lower because again that does not factor in that two hundred and fifty thousand rebate that we got in um, here. So. Um, so just our learnings, it's really important that as employers that we define our, our philosophy around benefits and benefit plan design because that's really going to drive how you structure your plans, um, how you decide about your contribution strategies with your employees. Um, the relationship with your carrier is different as a third party administrator than it is as your payers. Um, and that's been a really tough learning because because my docs all hate every carrier, right? You got heard a lot of boos about Anthem. You know, I could probably say a lot of names out there that aren't going to get a lot of love. Um, but when they are your provider as a um, third party administrator, you have to figure out how to not beat them up all the time um, and how to partner with them um, and still be tough in negotiations um, and let them know your expectations about what you want to see them do. And we as employers have to tell them that they've got to perform better um, and that is a message that you know I send to our partners all the time when we see stupid things on the payer side I'm calling the you know the the vice president on the employer side to say this is ridiculous you know you can't keep doing this to employers so you know we have to keep that message out there large because um, those employers and the employer voice is critically important. Um, make sure you know your data and your population. Um, you know again. Uh, we have a lot of women on our plan. That looks different than if you have a lot more men. It's just, I mean, just know your data out there. Educate your employees, and there's no magic bullet. You've got to evaluate options, push for better pricing, create solutions, um, and as Carl's going to talk about, making sure that we continue to think outside the box. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Thank you. Said here you want to go y'all flip it. Okay. Y'all ready to have some fun? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna walk around. I'm a walker. I, I can actually chew gum and walk at the same time. Um, thank y'all for letting me be here. Um, if you like what you hear, I, I will take tips. If you don't like what you hear, then you can talk to Karen Simonton. It's her problem. It's her fault. And Glenn Sumner and everybody else. Um, and Taylor Lindsay is one of my partners out here. He's out in the audience as well. And I'll, I'll probably recognize a few other folks. But th make no mistakes about it, folks. Healthcare isn't broken. It was absolutely made this way. I've been also accused of being a little passionate, so I'll try not to spit on anybody. But um, I get pretty fired up about this topic. And these insurance companies and this whole industry are brilliant. They have absolutely made a fortune. And when we talk about what's happened out there, if you look, who, who is an insurance carrier's fiduciary responsibility to? Anybody know? I'm not, not asking you. Anybody? Right. That's a problem when you're the employer on the other side, isn't it? So have the carriers done anything wrong? I don't think they have. They have delivered more value to their shareholder than any company in the history of the world when you look at their stock prices. So. It absolutely and broken, and this is what we've got that we like to use. Anybody like the matrix? That is our current situation. I'm also a fan of this saying, and that's what we see over and over. When we meet employers, they keep doing the same thing over and expecting different results, and so you've got to do something different and reset. So what's in this for you today? We're going to pull the curtain back and expose how the status quo has been set up to cost you a lot of money. We're going to empower you to break free of that and be able to offer 10 times the benefits for half the cost. Absolutely possible. And you're going to see examples up here with it. And you're going to become an active manager of your health plan. You're going to hear that a lot today. Active management. We're going to talk about that a lot. What does that mean? And by the way, I, I, I've got, I think Karen said two hours. Is that good? 
Is anybody going to laugh today outside of my group over there? They're expecting me to tackle you. That's what they're expecting. Well, last time somebody did that, they lost. So if y'all want to keep here, we'll, we'll take it outside if we run out of time. All right. What did she say? Okay. All right. And again, hopefully you can put some money back in your communities and your employees can save for retirement and do a lot of things. All we've done is shift the cost to the employees. So here are the, a couple of precepts we believe in. I already covered this one. And all of these folks up here, guys, you're going to hear me say the word cartel a lot. Is there any insurance companies in the house? Okay, good. Because I've, I've got people after me. Um, our community, what we do, we're employee benefit advisors. We've been a party to this too. We've been part of the cartel. Many of us changed, but what's happened is this whole thing is set up. I think Gene did a great job explaining that when he talked about what his broker did in the past and just kept passing these increases. Let's shop companies, flip companies, let's go to a different carrier. And, and again, I, the employees aren't to blame. This system hoodwinked them into this whole managed care, the copay masks the cost of care. I think everybody realizes that. Late 80s and early 90s, health care and insurance merged and became health insurance. That's when the whole system went, went, to, went, went to, I'm not allowed to cuss up here. I'm, okay, I won't say it. All right, and trend, this will get me fired up. I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes. But if you, who, how many of y'all have ever said your trend increase is 8%? Anybody ever heard that? Nobody? Gene, now, you've heard that, haven't you? There is no such thing as trend. If you're going to write anything down today, there is no such thing as trend, and I'm going to prove that to you in a few minutes. And Abuka is Blue Cross United Signet and Humana, just in case anybody didn't know. If you live in Florida, it might be Cuba. Um, richer plans equals less claims. You can offer more, plan more benefits for half the cost, and we're going to show you how. And then really try to relocalize care. Get care back in the communities. We need to keep care local, neighbors helping neighbors, like it was in the Marcus Well BMD days. All right, um, anybody a Seinfeld watcher? Okay, so what can you learn from George Costanza about healthcare? Does anybody remember the, the episode where he went down and, and said, I'm gonna do the opposite because everything I've ever done my whole life has never worked out? So he went and did the opposite and said, hey, my name is George, I'm unemployed, live home with my parents. And she said, have a seat. So what can you learn about that? Whatever your broker tells you, do the opposite. You'll be better off, I promise, unless we're talking to you. Um, but whatever they tell you, raise your deductible, raise your out-of-pockets. No, do the opposite. Why are you charging your diabetics for test strips and insulin? Do the opposite. Let them have it for free as long as they comply. Set up a program with a community pharmacy that they have to meet with once a month. And if they go in, they can get it for free. Then you keep them out of the ER. Then you keep them from becoming an inpatient admit. It's not rocket science. So do the opposite. That, that, that slide usually gets a lot of laughter, but not today. All right. All right, so real quick, I'm going to show you a video. Um, we were very fortunate. Um, a group called Patient Rights Advocate out of the D.C. and Boston area contacted an award-winning journalist. I think Karen's talked to her and said, do you know of any employers in the state of Florida doing anything innovative? We need to make some videos. This group was partly responsible for what, what Trump's um, State of the Union address on transparency. They were part of that. They have a front row seat to all legislation in DC. And so they contacted a, a, a mutual friend and then they came down and filmed our clients and HHS Secretary Azar and the White House have seen these videos. I don't know what they're doing with them, but they've seen them. So it was kind of a big deal, so I'm gonna let y'all see it. You ready? Well, the benefits that we have here at the hospital are more so focused on the employees. Um, the latter part of August, I was had a concern regarding my neck, and I went in to see my, my primary care, uh, listened to my concerns, and he recommended certain protocols. It was my choice of what I wanted to do. You would think with the specialist, the appointments are so far out. Within maybe three weeks from seeing my primary care, um, having my test done, getting my results, finding out that I need to have a biopsy done. Biopsy comes back, positive for cancer on the left side, and a week later, I was headed into surgery. As of today, all is well. 
I have gone through the process and estimated cost of $42,000. What did I pay? Absolutely nothing. So before, I was paying all that money on my premium, and I never used the plan because I was reluctant. Because if I, okay, I have this copay, I'm gonna have this deductible. We don't have those issues. Every concern I've had since day one of this plan, I have addressed and have taken care of this year. And I've paid absolutely nothing out of pocket. And we deserve that. I know I do. All right. So a couple of things. We're going to show actually a, a video about the hospital in a minute. But what's critical? Did everybody hear that? What we have today is a functionally uninsured America. You got insurance, but you ain't taking care of yourself because you're scared to death. I'm a walking, talking example. We were one of the first HSA adopters, high deductible health plan in 2006. And the doctor had me on by touring for cholesterol. It was $300 a month. I could afford it. I got tired of paying it. I wanted to pay a copay, so I quit taking it. And I'm pretty, well, I think I'm smart. Y'all have to uh, make that decision. But I quit taking it because I didn't want to pay the money. If I'm not taking it, what are the rest of your employees doing? So what we did here is we broke all barriers to care, and you heard her talk about that. That's really important. So we spent seven years studying this thing, and what we found is the six flaws in the system and turn them into opportunities for you. And I'm going to have to scoot and go fast through here, but... Uh, Again, data analytics, active management techniques, things, things Tommy mentioned earlier are really important. So here are the flaws in the healthcare system. The cartel, lack of pricing transparency, billing errors, traditional PPO discount game, and the pharmaceutical shell game, and lack of information data. We'll cover those. Here's the good news, folks. This isn't a, you know, put the hose in the exhaust pipe and crank the car up, okay, and sh shut your garage. The good news is it's opportunity. So what we're hoping to show you is to take it a step further what you're already doing and how you can augment what you're doing already today. So the underlying problem is pretty simple. I think everybody knows this. The only person that wants the cost to go down at the table is the employer. Everyone else makes more money the more the cost goes up. And that's kind of a problem. A lot of misaligned incentives. And this is healthcare in America today. And if y'all notice this, Look on the background at all the names of the stadiums and the, of the buildings, and notice who's not here. Does anybody recognize a party that's not present? There's no physician. Where's the doc? And who's helping this employer? And that's what we call the cartel. So here's what most people have that we run into in the marketplace. We call it a passive health plan. It's the easy button. You work with a buka, you, you get everything they have off the shelf. Do you think the things they have on their shelves are gonna lower your cost? Doesn't work well with their stock price if they lower your cost, does it? So that's what we call a passive health plan and it's buka insure built. So you can be self-funded in an ASO environment, administrative service only, but make no mistake about it. Very seldom we, they let you decide what parts you wanna use and build your plan. If you have a PBM you put in there, y'all know what PBMs are? Program Bilky Millions, okay? So if, they, if you have a PBM you want to put in there, why do they charge you $2 per employee per month for that? You think they make a lot of money somewhere? So that's a problem. So also we want to protect y'all from this. According to Karen, nobody likes the color orange here. So we want to keep y'all out of the orange jumpsuit. Um, but this is what's happening in the healthcare industry. The DOLs run around chasing pennies in the 401k, uh, running after investment advisors because they're violating fiduciary responsibility. While they're tripping over bags of money in healthcare, we're going to talk about. And ignorance is not a defense available to a fiduciary. Anybody scared? Go look up GAP right now. GAP, the the believer, the CFO and the HR are getting sued by its employees. It's been going on for a couple of years because a couple of employees had some bills and they, and they well, I think one of them, I'm, I'm making this up, but it's funny. I think there was a female that had a circumcision, a baby. I don't know how that happens. But anyway, things like that they found and they said, why are our premiums going, why are our benefits getting worse? Cigna's got a bunch of suits on them right now on these same types of things. So it's a problem. And this is where you don't want to be with your head in the sand. So what we try to do is really 
create a new model because this thing just did not work. We were frustrated with it. So we built this program called Fair Cost Health Plan. What it's about is actively managing your health plan. So you build it brick by brick. So we help, what we would try to do with people is help them pick the best bricks to build their health plan. That hospital you saw, Connie Cranford over here is one of our network uh, partners. We sat there from one o'clock till six o'clock in the evening building their health plan on October the 1st, 2018. You'll see the results of that in a minute. That's what you have to do. And it's all these bricks is what I'm gonna talk about. We'll go back. So we call that employer built health care. Okay? That's what you want. Ortho forum built, not insurer built. And you can take control of this. We're talking about working with independent third party administrators, not with Bucas. That's how you have to do that. Any questions so far? All right. And then basically it's kind of like this. Anybody know remember Mr. Potato Head? So, you know, you, you get these crazy looking things over here and, and they don't work. That's the traditional health plan today. When you can take it and unbundle it and deconstruct it and make your own plan that fits your needs and desires. So that's, we've always think that's a good analogy. Don't hide behind a Buka logo. These ID cards, guys, uh, I, I have to be careful because I'm going to go off on a rant. There are no payers in this business. You know who the payers are? It's the employers and the employees. The Bukas are processors. Don't call them payers. I've been working with Karen and their language and Glenn, and I even had a huge hospital system in Orlando after a three-hour meeting with the chief revenue officer, started calling them the processors. They are processing your money and your employees' money. So let's don't hide behind that. Why are we hiding behind that? Why do we have ortho forum built health care? You can have your own plan. Your logo ought to be on your card. The number one question we get is, how do we leave that Buka logo so when I pull my wallet out, I don't know how well, they're going to take my plan? It's your plan. Take it back. All right, here's a lot of stuff that we will not cover today. For lack of time, there's so many things you can do in a health plan, folks. So many things. It's endless. And basically, this is what we see a lot, too. Most people that we work with focus on the fixed cost. What does it cost us to run our plan? That's 20% of the dollar. But the other 80% is claims. So that's where you want to get your ROI and what you can do to make that difference. And that's where we see a lot of the issues that we're going to cover today. Any questions? You all having fun? Everybody looks pretty bored out there. I mean, uh, I've got another two hours, so we're good. All right. And then those are the kind of savings that can be generated in both areas. So this is a good example of a plan we built, and you're going to see from somebody in a minute. What's that deductible, folks? Why don't, why don't y'all have zero dollar deductibles? Because somebody told you raise the deductible, raise the out of pockets, right? Because you can't do it, right? Wrong. And that's all other health plans across. I'm going to go fast through here. Can y'all see that? Look at these guys. You had, this hadn't been around in 30 years. And I will tell you, this client's got the richest benefit plan in America. I guarantee it. No, nothing close. Connie's been a big part of that plan. Um, but here's what they pay. And the only way you can hit the out-of-pockets on their plan is you've got to take about 40 drugs a month. Because otherwise you can never hit out-of-pockets. It's not impossible. That's what they pay. $80 to $160 a month for dental and vision where most of Americans are paying three to 500 for employee-only coverage. And here are their benchmarks. Their benchmarks are lower than what you saw. Those, that, those are crazy. A lot of money. So um, I want to show you the DeSoto video because they built the fair cost plan. Again, Connie over here, Connie, raise your hand, was a part of this. Um, we didn't have any honest PBMs, so we did something different. We'll get to that in a minute. So, Here's the video about the hospital, and I'll just let it play. We are self-funded here at this facility and have been for 30 years. Our premiums kept going up and up and up. We're a small 49-bed hospital, and we realize that we've got to do something. When we met DeSoto Memorial, their health plan spend was about $2.2 million. Uh, we just wrapped up the first year, and the spend was around $990,000. So they saved $1.2 million, or 54%. It's remarkable how much you can discount the price of something if you know you're going to get paid at the time of service. What do we eliminate? The middle. We're going direct. 
That's how you save, it's direct to employer contracting. We negotiated a, a cash knee replacement price. That hospital was 70 grand. We got it for 25. Direct primary care, where you just pay $65 a month, and that covers all of your primary care. And sort of the bundled cash payments are two prongs of things that we can do to actually reduce the cost of health care. We also have a program that's called the Medical Advocacy Program. They walk you through the process. It was kind of blowing my mind when they turned around and said, well, we'll do everything for you. Getting them to the right doctor for the right quality, lastly, the right price and at the right time. That's what this is about. The less we have to spend on plan, the more we're able to put back into salaries back into maybe additional benefits or increasing benefits. There's medical expense per employee per year. We met them, it was almost $14,000 per employee per year. It's now up right around 6,000. Biopsy comes back, positive for cancer on the left side, and a week later, I was headed into surgery. As of today, all is well. I have gone through the process an estimated cost of $42,000. What did I pay? Absolutely nothing. And there was a lot of cost savings. So I actually got the bill three days ago, $31.76. An MRI is thousands of dollars. If something were to happen to me or, God forbid, one of my family members, it's covered. The opportunity to take this model that DeSoto has can be replicated across the country in all these rural areas. Absolutely. Not having to sit around that board table this, this year and say, okay, how much of the increase is going to go to, work, to the employees out of their pockets? It, it, I was giddy. I was excited that we did not have to do that this year. And we deserve that. I know I do. I, I want to say something too that Karen said. The, the thing that we, we, we do a lot of good work with our clients, but it's, that employer was courageous. They walked away from Buka, and we'll talk about it later. What they did is quite amazing. And as y'all see that, there are only 157 covered employees, and they saved 54% in one year and gave better coverage. Absolutely possible. And that, that, that we've been in the Texas legislature to talk about rural health care. We're doing it all over the country. This has become a, a great poster child of what can happen. And we'll get into it a little bit later. Well, I guess we'll get into it now. All right. So the challenges, Fourth Porch County, State of Florida, per capita income, 25,406. Lost obstetrics in February 18. By the way, my father was a 40-year practicing OBGYN, so can I, am I in y'all's club now? Does that count? I should have said that out of the gate. So I've been around at front and center. I've heard all the discussions at the dinner table of, of things. I, I still don't know what they are, but, um, but anyway, they have to drive an hour to have a kid. Foreign medical spend was 79%. That's how, many, how much the percentage the members went outside of the hospital to get care. Okay, now you're in a close, this is 38,000 people in this whole county. So I know that uh, so, uh, doc, uh, Karen doesn't want Dr. Schusler to see her naked because it's a little town, you know. So they go to a different hospital. And the way their plan was built, it was the same cost wherever they went. So it's a real problem. And guys, we want to keep this dollars local and help this community. That's what this is about, right? That was their spend. You saw that. Here are the results. They saved $150,000 in stop loss premiums with 157 people. 58%. Crazy. Weaponized their plan. They became their own PBM. We'll talk about this tomorrow, about some options you guys have that you all probably never explored. Uh, Tim Anderson from uh, Bright Orthopedics is doing some cool stuff. There's some opportunities there. I'm not going to get into it. We put in direct primary care. They have doctors, and they put direct primary care. Does everybody know what that is? All right, we're going to cover it in a second. And they hired the first full-time surgeon in county history. Their foreign medical spend went down to 62%. That's huge. And that was their spend, and y'all know, and they also got the second ever rate decrease in the history of the stop-loss carrier. Second ever rate decrease ever. And that was the savings. So y'all ought to give them a round of applause for them for doing that. All right, real quick, with the savings you have, one thing that y'all ought to consider doing is develop a benefits champion. With the money that's saved, you can have somebody on staff, 
Uh, John Harvey here in Arizona is doing some neat stuff with that. He's not here today because he had better things to do than hear us speak. Um, but anyway, we won't give him a hard time on that, will we, Tim? So anyway, this is what the member, this is what the benefits champion does, and they're there to help walk the employees through stuff. I don't know that I'm going to have time to show this, but I was going to let y'all hear from the employees of what Liz does for them. Connie knows Liz. Connie said, Liz is there for everything. These employees come to her for everything. It's about 205 employees on the plan here. So if you're spread out all over the country, you have to maybe put the member champion in some of our offices. But it's a good opportunity. We're going to met, skip that. All right, so let's get on direct primary care. i got to go through all these bricks. Basically, it's Marcus Welby. And I think y'all already know all this. Is any, this is not a mystery to everybody, right? It's a subscription-based model. So at DeSoto, they pay $65 for each, each, each adult, $25 for a kid, and $10 for each additional kid. And the hospital pays for that for them. That's one of the reasons we save so much money. We were taking care of the people. And what happens today in a fee-for-service environment, at least with my internist, is they refer out. They're referring to specialists all the time, right? And so that's a problem, and we cut that out. Oh, we got one back there. There's Dr. Johnson. Kendrick, say hey to everybody. Dr. Johnson is a direct primary care in Phoenix, as we sit here. Does great work. I met him at a conference. So anyway, that's, that's what that is. Why? This is, that taste crowd is tough. That's funny. Wow. That's what you're doing. Why are you doing it? And I'm not, I don't go over these stories, but very, well, very quickly. One of the members, we, Dr. Lee Gross, who's pretty well known nationally, he's been all over. He's up at the White House every other month. He is who brought us to this case, and we worked on it together with him. He literally had a member at that hospital who had been on Percocet for 15 years. I don't think you're supposed to do a talk like this on Percocet. I mean, and they sat down with them, that member talked to them, then got their spouse to come in, and they spent two hours together, fired the pain doctor, and the person now is off Percocet. And then a, a regular fee-for-service physician, it's not their fault, folks. I want to be clear, my father got in that whole thing, too, with managed care. It's not, they can't take care of the people because they don't have time. They've got to see 50 patients to pay their overhead. Y'all ought to know that better than anybody. And then we had a, a person that was addicted to opioids on the brink of suicide at 4.30. Dr. Gross got a call and had to talk him off a ledge. And I ain't making that up. So that's the power of direct primary care. Can't, Dr. Johnson back here, they do a great job. All right, cost and quality guidance. Very quickly, I'm going to play a video. What if we bought grocery where you buy health care? There are no prices on anything here. Oh, believe me, some of it's pretty spendy. I'll get it done. Whoa, that's really gone up. Okay, stop. I don't need both, just one or the other. It depends on the price. Oh, that's called shopping. We don't do that here. Thank you for coming in. Your bill? Your version will be mailed to you in 30 days. Good luck trying to make some sense. All right. Now, you know what? Now, I'm going to ask y'all, I'm going I'm to jump on y'all. Why are you laughing? That's what you're doing to your employees. Is that what y'all are doing? Or they know what they're buying? Do they know what it costs? How are we in a system that you go in a hospital and you don't find out what the bill is for 30 days? Ma'am, can I ask you a question, Linda? Yes. I, I've got a car I want you to take from me. Okay, would you, would you take the car? No. Why not? Well, no, it's, it's a good car, but I want you to tell you, you got to play with me here. Help me out. I, I might run out of time. All right. So here, here's, here's, I had to move my backpack from her because I thought she was going to steal it. But anyway, I've, look, all right. So the point is I've got a car and I want you to take it. Well, how much is it, Carl? Don't worry about it. Thank you. Don't worry about it. Just take it. And we go back and forth. Finally, you drive off. 30 days later, you get a bill for hundred grand. Carl, what is this? Well, that's the bill for the car. Well, I... Didn't know what it cost. Well, I don't care. You owe me hundred grand. That's what the system we live in. These clients you just heard from, they don't live in that system. We don't play that game. You don't need to. Networks and plan designs that obscure the, the, price, the relationship between price and cost. They offer artificial discounts. 
These bukas offer these discounts. Discount off of what? We'll get to that in a minute. And nobody knows what these things cost. The employee's not at fault. They're a victim of the system. And I mean, look at this. They don't care. But guess who cares? Ortho Virginia cares. So how do we get them to care? This is Atlanta, Upper GI. We got an employee that lives in South Atlanta. Emory Hospital, y'all ever heard of Emory? I'm sure you have. 2100 bucks. Piedmont Hospital, I'm sure you heard of that. It's a great hospital. They're building a huge new wing. You can't even drive by it, about knocks you down, but they're broke, you know. Um, and uh, that's great, I'm on tape with that. Okay, good. Better not walk around too much. All right, and then that's that, that firm charges her $85. They do more of those procedures than anybody, and their quality is very good. So the real challenge for all of you employers is, how are you going to get that employee to go there? How's that employee going to even know that? But you get them to go there by weaponizing the plan. We're going to cover that in just a second. By the way, Medicare pays $194. They know about this stuff. But this is what happens. It's just not right. Who's mad? <laughs> and do it with your money. All right. So we have access to some databases. We also talk with physicians, too, and we're able to look at quality metrics, readmit rates, complications, et cetera and we have access to it. Your employees have access to this. And again, in order to get them engaged, you've got to reward good decisions. So here's the example. We use a platform with nurse navigators that the members will call, and they will help direct them. And again, I'm going to keep talking about plan design has to reward good decisions. So very quickly, all of these physicians are in your BUCA network. Now, Linda, I know you're good friends with Physician I, and we call him Dr. Hodad. You know who that is? Hands of death and destruction. Okay, so that's your buddy, and, and you know him well. But you'd like to see Physician B, wouldn't you? How are your people going to know that all these are in the network? How are they going to pick them out? Here's a knee replacement, y'all's favorite. This is in St. Petersburg, Florida. There's 60 doctors that do knee replacement. We wanted to have a cut at, at doing at least 50 procedures a year. 14 did 50 procedures a year out of 60. Then we looked at the quality metrics, eight, then the cost of the implants, and four fell out of the network. How is that member going to find those four doctors? How? And y'all know better than anybody with this kind of work, if, it, if a knee replacement doesn't go great, what's the rehab? How much are they out of work? How much time do they miss? What's the productivity lost? And then we can look at this, and Karen told me to be careful on this one, but um, my dad said this, I'll tell you this, that doctor had 4.47 deaths on the, ta on the table doing knee replacements. Now my father immediately said, son, how do you know that he wasn't dealing with 85 and 90 year old people with 20 comorbidities? Fair enough, dad. But anyway, y'all get, get the picture. And then with the hospitals, you can see how many they do. And that's the kind of information your member will get. And it is absolutely available, but you, we have a tool that we use. So it is available. You've got to get it in their hands. Nurse navigators do it. We do use cash pricing whenever possible, and the plan designs have to incentivize it. I want to give you all a quick example. This is a hospital in Florida. I will leave the hospital name off. They charge $37,000 for a vaginal birth. We were able to get a cash price of $6,500, including anesthesia. Cash. If we were with a buka, we'd have gotten it for $18,500. That's what's possible. How many of you physicians wouldn't like to get paid on the spot? Paid 30 days in advance. Pay the day of like that. That's what, you, that's what we try to do. So how does your network help employees find the best providers? They don't. Jeez, this is a rough crowd. Do, I, why do, do we speak right after lunch? All right. It's price is right. You know, he's just slinging it. So what we often do is we require that employee to call that cost and quality company anytime they have a pre-certed or an elective procedure. If they do not call, they will be penalized $1,000.
Now, we're, everybody, oh, that's going to hurt. My members are going to be all upset. It's for them. It's to protect them. And if they call, they still, if, you, if they say, don't, don't see Dr. Simonton, she's a, she's a hag, don't see her, they can still go. But the plan is going to pay as it always has. Maybe it has a deductible. Some of y'all's plans, I'm sure have deductibles. Some of ours don't. Or maybe you give them some cash back. But if they follow the instructions, then we treat it differently. And I will tell you, it is amazing, and I know Connie can stand up over there and talk about it, it's amazing how different the employees act when you get in their pockets. And the most important thing is you're doing a great thing for them and getting them where they need to be. And y'all ought to know from being physicians, every orthopedic surgeon is not created equal. All right, number three, medical billing errors. I don't have time, but anybody know when this video is shot? All the ladies always get it because they know the hairdos. I'm terrible at that. So anybody know when this video is shot? Come on, quick. When? 2010. And it's still when going on. I got to on. look at these hospital bills. I couldn't believe what I saw. You know what? A trillion dollars is wasted in this country on ridiculous Very medical expenses. Very conservative news station, too. Here are a few examples. All right. When you were I... All they're going to talk about is $1,000 toothbrush, things like that. So, billing errors. In October 15, we had a great idea. Let's, let's, let's increase the codes numbers. How many doctor's offices were happy about that out there? That, that'll work. The U.S. General Accounting Office, our own government, says that there's 99% are of, of, of overcharges. Equifax, 40,000 bills, 97% were found. Services never provide an accurate quantity of services, bundling, unbundling. When something happens 97% of the time, folks, I don't believe it's an error. Would you pay this bill? Who knows what a UBO4 is? Anybody? Okay, good. I figure some of you would know that. It's a summary bill. Here's an item I statement. So if, 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 if Karen and I were to, to if, if Karen was to take me to dinner to thank me for coming here and delivering this magnificent presentation that nobody laughs at, um, I would, uh, it, 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 uh, <laughs> all right. So Karen gets a bill for it. What Karen's going to get is this, and she's going to lay. She's going to get that. Some, I mean, excuse me. She's going to get the itemized bill, lay her card down, and then get a summary bill. It's not how this works. This is what the hospital send your 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 ASO carrier, your Buca, and I'm telling you right now. I'm going to show you a, a, a near dear person, of my, a friend of mine. This is my wife. Meet Melissa R. Schusler up here. That's a UB4, folks. Remember when I said healthcare is not broken, it was made this way? Everyone says, Carl, why don't you get a better copy? You're doing all these talks. That's the best copy I could get, and it took three weeks to get it. They wouldn't give it to us. Everything on yellow is wrong on that bill. This was a laparoscopic appendectomy for the low, low Litco price of $29,984. That's, in my opinion, crazy as it is. The doctor got paid a couple of thousand dollars, and I would hire the doctor in a minute and let him do it right here. I don't care about the hospital as much. So let's look at the bill. So I'll show you all a couple of things. This is really important right here. So hospitals bill in 15-minute increments in the OR. My wife was in there for an hour. So if you can see that, $5,654 was the OR charges. That's it. But they unbundled. She got charged for urine qualitative, $204. Anybody know what that is? It's an early pregnancy test. We could have walked to CVS, one of the other cartel members, and gotten it for eight bucks. But that's what she got charged for. All of that because they had to make sure she wasn't pregnant. We also got charged 90 bucks for oxygen, $1,360 for a stapler to staple those four holes back up. You can't do that because they charge, that goes in this charge, they unbundled and charged twice for it. And I guarantee you on all your bills, I, I, I see it over and over. It's, it's the easiest thing to do. And we kept going, all the things in yellow are a mistake. By the way, you see how many pages the itemized bill was? Five pages. I've seen a million dollar cardiac catheterization at Duke that was 100 pages long. They don't give the itemized bills to your carriers. They only send the summary bill. Is everybody, is everybody following that? They don't give that to them. How can you verify the accuracy? Would y'all ever sign an Office Max or Office Depot contract without knowing what the cost of everything you're buying is? Why are we doing this? This is my favorite. Missy got charged $957 for an observation room she never was in. 
I don't know if it had a view of a dumpster, downtown Atlanta, I don't know what it was, but we were never in it. So the bill, as I said, was 29000 should have been nineteen. There were $10,694 of billionaires on the bill. Then you can apply the discount to that, right? So that's the real problem. Why don't we go back to the old days? This seemed to work a lot better. Childbirth, 1943, $29.50. That's worked. All right, one last one. This is a uh, hip replacement, $227,000, and there were 16 titanium screws used for $97,000. That's a heck of it. I bet you can't find that at Ace Hardware. <laughs> Got the itemized bill? There were four screws. Saved the client $55,000. Who thinks that's going on in their health plan right now? Guys, ignorance is not a defense. I'm telling you, there's an onslaught that's coming in the future. People are not going to sit around and take this anymore. So again, everything's paid off a uniform bill. All right. Number three, what you can do, they'll tell you, no, you can't do this. You absolutely can put a program in, get an independent examiner, look at any bill over $10,000. They take it and look at it. It'll, you'll knock 17, 25% off your facility bills in a heartbeat. Normally, a health plan spend 60 to 70% is in facilities. So do the math and work backwards in your head and figure out what that would mean to you. That's absolutely something you need to do. All right, define benefit pricing. Let's talk about this. I'm gonna have some fun and get these books out. All right, I gotta pick on somebody outside of Linda. Who are we gonna pick on? Somebody call their name out. I can't get Spooner. Would you like to play today? Sure. Okay, what's your name? Linda. Okay, Linda. All right, the system is built on what we call top-down pricing. So the prices are set by the insurance company and hospitals, right? But when you go to buy a car, you do what we call bottom-up pricing. You go in and they say, you know what the cost of the car is already because you've been able to look at Kelly's Blue Book, and you negotiate with them, and they go meet with the manager, they come back, and you save money. That's bottom-up pricing. That's not what we have here. So what I ask you is, I've got a good deal for you today. What's your favorite store to shop at? Macy's, okay. My great-great-grandfather was one of the founders. I don't know why I'm out here, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, they kicked me out of the house. Um, I'm going to offer you a deal today. I'm going to give you 50% off at Macy's the rest of your life. One stipulation. You can't review your bill. Would you take that deal? Why? Right. Why are we doing this to all our employees out here, guys? That's the game you're playing. Discount off of what? Here, you get the, I'll give you a book. This is, I'll give you that one. Thank you. All right. There's no correlation to cost of services. And the PPOs have done a wonderful job. They've done such a good job. The cost has gone up four times since they came in their existence. And that's why everybody's in this meeting, to try to hear about how to fix it. Our longest article in the history of Time Magazine. Steve McBrill wrote it. Longest article ever. That's the bottom line. A discount, if you, the starting price is what matters. I don't care if Blue or Cigna comes in and says we have a 70% discount. Discount off of what? I sat with so many CFOs, HRs, and asked that question. We moved from Cigna to Blue Cross. Why? They have better discounts. Discount off of what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, come on, folks. All right. All right, now I get to my favorite, trend. This is my favorite. This is the state of Florida, 10 years of inpatient hospital stays. 10 years. This is why you will not win in the, in the, the traditional passive management system. Watch this real quick. I'm going to fire it out. Length of stay, average Medicare payment, and this is the commercial carriers, their charges to Medicare. I'm going to go fast. I want you to look at this. All right. Here's what I love. Trend, it's the advancements in medicine or medical technology. That's what, who's heard that before? Really? Help me out here, guys. 2007, the length of stay was 3.93 days, and it's 4.3 later. If we're getting better, why are people staying in the hospital longer? That trend over here that you're playing in is 100% over 10 years. 100%. Medicare went up 11.2. There is, everybody clear, there is no such thing as trend. It doesn't exist. Don't buy it. Send them back packing if they come in there with that. 
All right, here's a CT scan. That's actually at Emory Hospital. Hospital bill charge of three grand. We know that the hospital cost them $45 because they filed with CMS. Medicare pays $175. We'll go broke on Medicare. Who would like to make four times their cost back on, on a, doing a procedure? Anybody in this room? Oh, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's what the average carrier reimburses. You don't have to do that, folks. All right, so here's what we do. Y'all, whether you're 300 people, 100 people, or 1,000, you can go negotiate. You have purchasing power. It's absolutely possible. You can do it. What CalPERS did, and CalPERS is the largest health plan in America, 1.3 million lives, California Public Employees Retirement System, they were spending, they were spending 100 grand, 50 grand, 300,000 for knee replacements and hip replacements. They went to four hospitals and said, here's what we're gonna do, folks. We're gonna pay you $30,000 for every hip and knee. Do you wanna play ball or not? Four hospitals go, I'm in, and the rest of the hospitals didn't play. Over the course of year, every hospital came in and did it for that deal. You can do that in some of your markets. I promise, Connie, we've done it. Absolutely is possible. Taylor, I know you've done it too. All right, build your own network. Ortho forum network, build your own network. It's absolutely possible to do it. Leverage the position in the community. You physicians out there, y'all are significant players in the community. You're a large employer, many of you guys. You can do that. And find hospitals you can create safe harbor relationships with to steer people to, like we talked about weaponizing the plan. And then direct contracting. We're gonna talk more about that tomorrow. If y'all are gonna come to that session after hearing me today, you probably don't wanna come, right? But anyway, that was supposed to be funny, apparently not. So, geez, I'll tell you what, I'm, my dad's gonna be mad. All right, so if you do the direct contracts, there's no balance billing issues. And again, you can do it for all of these things. We do it all the time. What you saw, guys, is how a lot of these companies are saving money by getting outside the box. You don't have to have a network, or you can, and that'll save you, because these, these bookers charge you a ton of money for these networks, for those wonderful discounts, right, Linda? How's that working out for you? Okay, did y'all hear her say not well? All right, so real quickly, this is near and near to is one of mine and Connie's clients. Y'all should understand this. Fractured radius. This is a true story. It's the hotel you saw earlier with the benefits champion. $198,000 fractured radius. How much did the doctor get of that? Not enough, right? I mean, we need the doctors. Look at the fractured humerus. I'll give them credit. They had to put a pin in and all that stuff, or a rod, so okay. With the Buca discount, that's what it would have been. With our programs, that's what the client paid. 17,000. So you want to talk about discounts, how about 89%? Absolutely do it. This is being achieved in the most expensive healthcare in America, which is the state of Florida. Had the highest charges in Medicare of any state, hands down. And these Texans over here will try to argue because everything's bigger in Texas, but they're, they're wrong. All right, no offense, Doug. All right, RX optimization. All right, quickly. Um, now I'm gonna speak. So we, get, we have an honest PBM in the room? Apparently. Yeah, y'all meet Bill Miller with Drexel. He's an honest PBM here in Arizona. And if you believe honest, that honest PBM is like an oxymoron, isn't it? No, they do a good job, but that's, it's a shell game. It's a black box. That's how it works, folks. Here you are. Here's your employee. I'm not real smart, but I think there's a lot of money changing hands. There's a lot of middle people in there, isn't it? So it's, it's the most unregulated thing we've got. The, Humira was the number one advertised drug a few years ago. Who's seen a commercial for Humira? It's four to five grand a month a pop. It's crazy. No other countries allow advertisement. 3 billion to the political class, all the lobbying money. Used to be 8% of your dollar, now it's 28 to 30%, 25 to 30. We're seeing some is approaching 50. Here's a great example. I hope none of y'all know what Avastin is. It's for cancer. It costs six grand. Did y'all see what Duke charged? $23,000. Problem. Um, and again, the rebates. I don't have time to really get into that discussion. But, I mean, Lord, that's, just, that's, just, that's, a, that's a total mixed bag. And how do you know if you ever got the full rebate? Tommy talked about a great program they put in, but how do we ever know if we get it all? None of us would know. We don't know. Even if you work with an honest PBM, we wouldn't know. So 
Anyway, they're your dollars. Quit enriching other people. By analyzing the data, we can do a lot, and then we recommend all you hire a pharmacy consultant. That hotel pays a pharmacy consultant $500 a month. All of our employers do that because they've forgotten more than we'll ever know. You have to have a specialist in that area. So very quickly, uh, I love to show this one. It's a Fortune 500, folks. Number, number six, United Healthcare. They own their own PBM. They own 630 companies. One of them is Optum. Optum owns 292 companies. Do you know who owns more physicians in the country than anybody? Optum. Right amongst our very eyes, this has all happened. And everybody sat there and watched. I need to get cut. Okay. Um, so anyway, I don't, but you know that Aetna and CVS are merging and Cigna and Express Scripts are merging. I don't know how the DOJ allowed it. Really don't. And then the group that makes the drugs, look where they rank. So this is a good picture of it, just to show you the middle people. There's just some manufacturers. These are all the companies that are implicated in many of the opioid suits. They're the ones that push the, push the drugs to the pharmacy. And then you got the pharmacy benefit managers. And then you got your different pharmacies. So five buckets of savings. Move to a pass-through PBM, folks. It eliminates spread pricing. I'll talk about it very quickly and get into that in just a minute. Your average savings per thousand employees is about 170,000 minimum. Preferred, non-preferred. Who's heard of in-network and out-of-network for uh, physicians and hospitals, right? Y'all know that, right? Okay. Why don't you do that with the pharmacy? Find out who they are. Go work with the preferred pharmacies or your community pharmacies and your grocery stores and then make the cartels, CVS, right at all of them, is a more expensive copay by 15 bucks. So here you want all your local pharmacies protected here, but it, they can still all go to these other pharmacies. Just charge them 15 to $20 more copay. Guess where the people will go? They'll go there. That's real simple stuff. That's your average savings there. What is spread pricing? Very quickly, this is the total dollars allowed by the PBM for the drug. That's what the pharmacy gets for their, um, for their uh, for the cost of the drug and the dispensing fee. Patient paid this, but the PBM billed the plan sponsor for $17.97. So $15.72 spread. That is happening, I guarantee you, on 50 to, I'm gonna, I, I pay 80% of your plans, especially working the Buca. If you removed it and did your own carve out and your own PBM, we see it all the time. I won't name one of them, but it's supposedly the transparent one. We call them spread pricing numerous times. That will save you a lot of money. Specialty drugs, I think everybody knows that. You've got to find ways to purchase those. We have, there's a lot of techniques and, tr and things to do there, and that's what you could say. The other thing, and I know it's going to be talked about tomorrow, Duexis, $2,500. Vomovo, remove dumb drugs. There's 800 er therapeutic equivalents for it. Don't cover it. A lot of these PBMs move them up in formulary so they get the rebates, and then you're paying for it. No need for that. Get that off your plan. And then the last one, don't play the mail order game, right, Bill? Do it retail, and people have to fill them at a preferred pharmacy. That'll save you $86 a script, 86 bucks a script. Do away with mail order. All right, and then this very quickly, um, this is one of our uh, prospects we were dealing with. That was their spend. The national average used to be 92. If we got them to the national average, we'd save them that much. If we got them to the fair cost average, that's how much they could save. Guys, that's 600 employees. It's absolutely possible. And then lastly, active data mining. I'll move on quick. Um, this is, I think Tommy did a good job in this area. It's like the Yellow Pages versus Google. These carriers, databases, and how they do their data, it's horrific. And I can prove it. I want to talk off the, uh, later on. But here's the real key. This is a 32,000 members, a study we did. Um, what you're going to find is 10% of your members drive 73% of your cost, right? That's how it's always been. What are you doing about those people? That's what you have to do. So there's 27 chronic conditions that are tracked. We normally, we stratify the risk, and then we apply the right resource and right care at the right time, right place for the right price. Here are some of the conditions tracked. I'm going to move very quick. Here's a case study. Uh, Connie, this is one of mine and Connie's clients. That's the hospital, guys. We looked at BUCA data for two years, very static, not a lot of hiring and firing going on at the hospital. 
We identified 66 people who had, I'm going to show you, lifestyle, active disease, and disease man and uh, chronic. In three months on our platform, we identified 31 more people that they never caught. Those, three, those 31 people had to have a claim to show up. And those are the things where we stratify the risk. You've got to manage these people, folks. That's the group you've got to manage. And then opioids, big problem. Same thing with the hospital. That's the kind of thing. And you work with, I'll, I'll explain the opioid uh, uh, program later. But the granular data that you can do when you have good data is, is unbelievable to really drill down. And this is probably my favorite. This is a client of ours that had some, uh, had some radiation treatments and stuff, injections. The plan paid 206. The quantity was 700. Guys, to have the quantity of 700, you had to weigh 2,000 pounds. We were able to get it reversed and fix it for our client. That's what you can do with data drill down. And lastly is UMDMCM. Let me stop. Okay. I'll, I'll stop. That's the mo to me, this is the, the hidden gem that everyone whiffs on. And when you work with certain buca carriers, you can't get utilization management pulled out. You have to use them for it. They don't care about doing that correctly. It's, I think we've proven that. That's how our programs work. And you really get control the utilization management. You can make a lot of hay. And then what's done on the case management side also. So in summary, we've chosen to seek a different path. And you guys can too. Active management of your plan. And you don't work with brokers. You work with population health managers. Brokers sell insurance. You need to find people that build health plans piece by piece, brick by brick, that are population health managers, and then utilize granular data. I'm done. I'm fine. Excellent. So before we uh, break for Q&A, let's just thank the panel and for their time and expertise. And I will, I will open it up for questions from the courageous employers in the audience. No questions? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Uh, 2.50. So the question was, when does the stop loss kick in for Ortho, Virginia? Mm -hmm. So we covered the 200, 250, and then we have one claim that's lasered at a half a million dollars. And has that been the case throughout the entire self-insurance because I know you had a piece of that uh, practice. We actually that was were at 200, um, and then we adjusted it to 250 when we were all in, just because of our um, claims risk and our um, utilization. So, Do you have I will, a if I could re reiterate a couple of things that Carl said um, re regarding price transparency. Um, one of the things that we've done a lot of education to our employees about is where they can go to find that information. The carriers are being pressured, so whether you want you use them or you go with a solution like Carl, like make sure you know who your TPA, um, where they have that data, because you can actually go out and search by procedures as well as by pharmacies. And so we spend a lot of time educating employees that not all pharmacy costs are equal. Um, so don't just go to the Rite Aid because it's by your house when you can go to the other pharmacy up the street where you're going to get that drug for a lower cost. Um, we also did the 90-day retail uh, with preferred pharmacies, and that was uh, a huge employee booster. So, you know, make sure you're, you're looking at those things within your plans, um, even if you don't go down the path um, of, you know, what um, employee benefit solutions, you know, can provide to you. Um, I also think that, um, you know, making sure that you are looking at those comorbidities within your plan data, you're targeting those employees from a communication perspective, because that's a huge thing that, you know, um, and making sure that they're uh, uh, adhering to their care compliance, um, because they, the people who aren't complying with the care standards are the ones that are driving your claims costs, and that's really important to make sure you're educating those folks, too. So I think lots of really great points, Carl. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Mark Bernhardt, Perlant Surgeons from uh, Seattle, Washington. And I found some of your examples, um, you know, like a lot of the pricing is for the hospitals is based on inpatient DRG pricing. So the pricing that the payers are paying, I think, are much less than the examples that are in here in, in your presentation. 
Uh, I'm wondering if you spend more time focusing on the outpatient side, which I think is much more abusive on the hospitals. The, the hospitals have, since the mid-'80s when DRG pricing came in, they forced everything over from a pricing standpoint into the outpatient departments. And what we're doing with our own benefit plans is we're saying we'll provide 100 percent coverage if you do something in an ambulatory surgery center for surgery. And uh, we charge a 30 percent coinsurance if you go have a surgery in a hospital outpatient department, uh, as an example. So I, I'm wondering, it's, s some of this to me was uh, a little sensational on the, uh, the examples that you've given, and I'm just wondering if uh, there is a more refined focus than what we heard separating inpatient versus hospital outpatient. Sure, that's a good, good point, good question. What we have seen out there, that example on the fracture radius and the fracture humerus, those discounts probably there are, are about 60%, and I just haven't changed that example. But as far as the reimbursements, and this is over lots of claims analyzed, there are some claims that are reimbursed at DRG, to your point, but there's a lot of them that are percent of bill charges. So we have, we have worked through numerous examples. Our bill review company catches this over and over every day. The blues, some of them have shifted in certain markets to DRG-based things, but everything you saw there, um, those are real-life examples that have happened with our clients. Well, I mean, like I said, the discount is, is more like in that market is 60. I just, I had that, that slide, I need, I need to probably put the 60% in that column. But everything else, my wife's claim, those are all exactly what happened and so forth. I don't, I, that's, we're still seeing it happen. Connie, do you, Doug? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Connie, what do you see on your side? He's talking about inpatient, outpatient. Yeah, and one other thing I want to say too, when these networks tell you 60% discounts, you really got to dig deep because I'm telling you, it ain't 60% across the board. We've seen that numerous times, but it is a steerage, and you're right, outpatient is where all the action's going. And in our programs, I apologize, I misunderstood the question, but with outpatient, we absolutely steer to ASCs all the time, as long as the quality lines up. Yes, sir. Grant Zarzer, a surgeon in Mobile. Um, a question on the surgeon data that you're able to acquire. I was talking with a TPA recently who had the same kind of claims, and we were going over the data, and it was very dated. How do you get up-to-date, accurate data? We picked a, a high-performance healthcare solution partner that uses CMS, and they also use com some commercial databases. 
And then we've had some other physicians in the area too that they looked at it and we've gotten opinions from them too. But it is a third party that we use and that's what they access, CMS and some commercial okay. data. We, we did actually interview, Terry Ripley had to go to the other meeting, but we actually interviewed a company called Quantros who does Healthcare Blue Book and they do the imaginary, imagination plan for Disney. They do a lot of that work and what they're willing to do is not only provide their data set but to take data from us and allow us to do some data integrity yeah. work because I think that's really important. And, and if employers are looking at it, we want to be looking at it as providers and physicians to say that's accurate or no, it's not. Because for those of you that have been in BPCI, you know sometimes that what comes back to you is not exactly what happened. And, and Karen, our analytics platform actually has Quantos integrated in it. So we, that's used as well. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all, Carl and Taylor and Bill Miller and uh, Mr. Aldean and Connie will be here, so uh, they, Doug will certainly be available to you if you have other questions. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you.